Hello and welcome to today's ACM Learning Webinar. This webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and serving over 100,000 computing professionals and students who are ACM's members. I am Eric Meyer. Currently, I'm the CEO of Applied Duality, which I founded in 2013. In the past, I headed the cloud programmability team at Microsoft, where I worked on C Sharp, Visual Basic, Link, Volta, and the reactive programming framework for .NET. My research has included areas of functional programming, compiler implementation, in particular Haskell, parsing, programming, language design, XML, and front function interfaces. I've also taught at Delft University of Technology and Utrecht University, and I'm a member of the ACMQ Magazine Editorials Board. Before I get started, uh, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping items shown on the slide uh, in front of you. On the top right corner of the slide area on your screen, there's a little button that will allow you to enlarge the slides. You may also enlarge the slides at any time by dragging the corner of the slide window. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event um, pushed by the presenter. During this presentation, you can minimize the slide area, QA, and bio screens using the buttons on the bottom panel. You can also use a number of widgets also found on the bottom, pa bottom panel, including Facebook, Twitter, Wikipedia, and a resource list where you can get a copy of the slides. If you are experiencing problems with our web interface, please refresh your console by pressing the F5 keys on Windows, or Command plus R if you're on a Mac. Refresh your browser if you're on a mobile device, or close and uh, reboot the presentation. You can also visit the webcast help guide by clicking on the help widget below the slide window. To control volume, please adjust the master volume on your computer. You can also use the Facebook and Twitter widgets on the bottom panel to share the presentation link with your friends, as well as tweet comments and questions using the hashtag ACMWebinarRuby. We will be watching for your tweets and um, answering them uh, later on. Today's presentation is Ruby for the Newbie by David A. Black. Okay. Thank you very um, much, Eric. Oh, no. uh, I, 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 will, I will introduce you, um, David. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I, I, was, you know, I was behind clicking a few buttons here. So um, right. everybody, um, you already heard David here. David Black is a longtime Ruby developer, trainer, author, speaker, and community event organizer, and currently a lead developer at the New York-based consultancy Serious Innovation which he joined in 2009. David speaks and keynotes frequently at technical conferences and users group, and his book, The Well-Grounded Rubyist, is amongst the most highly regarded books on Ruby. A second edition is forthcoming from men in publications. David was one of the founders and for many years a director of Ruby Central Inc., the parent organization of the official international Ruby and Ruby on Rail conferences. He is a member of the ACM Professional Development Committee and the author of ACM's Ruby Learning Path, a project for which he was recommended to ACM by Ruby creator Yuki Hiro Matsumoto himself. David, um, I'm really looking forward to your presentation, and I'm sure all the people that are watching as well. So there you go. Great. Thank you very much, Eric. And. Um, I think you've covered most of what's in my first slide, which is about me. Um, I am, as Eric said, I'm at Cyrus Innovation in New York. I started using Ruby in 2000, um, which was the year that the book Programming Ruby was published by the Pragmatic Programmers. Um, so I belong to kind of the, the generation that adopted Ruby or got into Ruby as, as a result of reading that book. Um, and actually, that book is still going strong, too. And I'm not sure what edition, but it's still around. Um, and I am indeed a former director of Ruby Central and one of the founders, and that organization puts on Ru RubyConf and RailsConf, um, which I hope some of you either have been to or will go to if you get very into Ruby. I'm also a, a trainer 
and a Ruby Standard Library contributor. I'm the author of, or chief author of scanf.rb, which I'll actually be talking about very briefly toward the end of the presentation. Okay, enough about me. Let's talk about Ruby. Ruby was created and is still developed and guided by Yukihiro Matsumoto, generally known as Matt. He first announced Ruby in February of 1993, so we're looking at Ruby's 21st birthday recently. Um, the first, or version 1.0 of Ruby was released on Christmas in 1996, and that actually started a tradition of, um, of Christmas releases of Ruby versions, which still goes on to this day. Not every single one, but it's, it, most of them are released on Christmas. Ruby is an object-oriented, general-purpose programming language. It is sometimes referred to as a scripting language, though I find that term a little bit pejorative sometimes. It is, it is a programming language. It's interpreted. Um, ancestors include Smalltalk, Lisp, Perl, and Clue. Um, it's very dynamic, as you'll see in some of the examples. Um, the, the variables are untyped, which means you don't have for example, in Perl, you have dollar signs in front of scalars and at signs in front of arrays and so on. In uh, Ruby, the variables are, are not themselves typed. Um, and as I mentioned a few minutes ago, it was introduced widely outside Japan through this book, Programming Ruby, which was published in 2000. And Ruby was further popularized by the Ruby on Rails web development framework which um, is still going strong at age almost 10, I believe. Um, and a lot of people have come to Ruby because they got interested in Ruby on Rails and discovered the language and got very into it and so on. Okay. We're going to start with what I'm calling some basic basics, just to give you an initial flavor of the language. And then just to let you know where we're going after that, I'm going to talk about some of the built-in um, classes and constructs and objects in Ruby. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the Ruby object model and some of the uh, some of the techniques for building classes and modules and so on. But just to let a little bit of Ruby kind of wash over you, here's some some basic basics. The first line puts or put s hello world. That the puts or put, I tend to say put s because I think of it as put string. So I'll say put s. The put s method um, does kind of what it sounds like. It prints a string. It adds a new line to the string. There is also a print method, which doesn't add a new line. But put s adds a new line, so a nice, nice um, sort of nicely formatted hello world. Variable assignment in the next line, x equals 10, y equals x times 2, some basic arithmetic. Nothing too surprising there. Again, untyped variables, and you can assign to them without um, declaring them. Um, then there follows a couple of method definitions, def greet, put s hello world end. Greet, in this case, greet is a method which you can then call simply by using the method name, as you can see from the example down at the bottom where it says greet, and the output indicated is hello world. And similarly, the method shout, which is a little fancier because it prints the upcase version of the, of the string. If I say, having defined the method shout, if I say shout, or I type shout, I get the output or the result, hello world, in uppercase letters. So that's actually an example. The, the, the put as hello world dot upcase is an example of sending a message to an object. The object is actually the string hello world, and the message is upcase. And we're sending the message or calling the method upcase on the object, on the string object hello world. Okay, a couple of further basic basics. Um, this is just a little bit of control flow. We have A equals 1, B equals 2. If A is greater than B, put S, huh? Else put S, that's more like it. So we get, that's more like it. Just to show you, again, nothing too surprising, but there's basic if, else, there's unless, there's until, and while, various control flow options. I don't have examples of all of them, but there's a full toolkit of that in Ruby, as you might expect. 
One tool that I wanted to bring to your attention is something called IRB, the Interactive Ruby Interpreter. If you have Ruby, then you have IRB. And I recommend very highly if you get interested in Ruby or even now if you have Ruby installed and, and uh, you know, now or after the presentation if you want to try it, um, try out IRB and just type some Ruby expressions into it. You get immediate feedback. Um, it's a read, evaluate, print loop. So you get immediate feedback for whatever, your, uh, whatever, your, whatever you type in. I've started it here with IRB dash dash simple prompt, which just means that I get two arrows instead of more elaborate prompts involving the line number and things like that. So if you don't say simple prompt, it still works. Okay, let's delve a little bit into Ruby's object model. Ruby is, as I said, object oriented, and almost everything in Ruby is an object including classes. Classes are actually themselves first class objects. Any object is an instance of a class, but you can also, as I'll show you, you can also teach objects individually, which is another way of saying a given object can actually acquire behaviors or methods that other objects of the same class don't have. So Ruby is, in that sense, very object-oriented. Ob objects can actually sort of travel away from the class that created them and, and do other things. The class hierarchy descends from the sort of big classes in the sky called object and basic object. Basic objects have almost no methods. Objects have a kind of handful of methods that, that, um, that are common to every object because they're inherited from objects. To instantiate an object, generally, depending on what class it is and what your purpose is. Generally, you say, you say the name of the class dot new. So in this case, I'm creating just a vanilla generic object. Object equals object dot new. And what I've asked for is the object ID. Put as object dot object ID. I get a number. It will vary when you run it, obviously. But uh, every object has a particular object ID. I shouldn't say obviously. Some objects have the same ID every time, integers and, and nil and certain special objects. But if you just create a kind of generic object, chances are when you do it, you'll get a different number from what I got when I did it. Um, but you can use that to uniquely identify any object. Okay, the bread and butter of Ruby is sending messages to objects, also known as calling methods on objects. And the way it sort of parses out is that you send a message to an object, and if the object understands the message, that means it has a method with the same name as the message that it can execute. So methods get called when the message is understood. And message sending is accomplished with dot notation. So down here we have a sample str string equals sample string. And that thing with the hash mark is just a comment, a string object. And I say put s string dot upcase. And what I've done here, and there's an example similar to this a few slides ago. I said string, then the dot to send a message. And then I send the message upcase. And I get the result, which is the content of the string in uppercase letters. Similarly, put s string dot reverse, I get the string backwards. So this is just the basic, as I say, kind of bread and butter sending messages to objects, which is really what most of Ruby programming is about. Now, I also mentioned that you can teach an object, that objects can kind of travel away from the classes that created them. Um, and here's an example. These are called singleton methods. When you define a method on a specific object that's only for that object and not others of its class. And we will get to classes um, presently. But here I've got object equals object dot new, so another kind of vanilla generic object. And I define a method. Again, that def keyword means I'm defining a method. In this case, unlike my first method greet, which was just a sort of top level method here, I'm actually attaching a method name to a specific object. So def object dot talk really means define a method called talk just for this one object. So I'm defining the method directly on the object and it says good as good afternoon from an object. When I run it, object dot talk, I get the uh, the expected message. 
So objects are very sort of independent in Ruby. They they do come from classes, as you'll see now, but um, but you can you can flex them. You can do specific things with them that are not the same as what they what they got from their classes. Speaking of classes, everything in Ruby, as I said, every object is an instance of a class. And we'll be talking about some of the built-in classes, strings and arrays and hashes, for example. But here's an example of defining or, or writing a class of your own, in this case a class called person. An example I seem to use a lot, but it works out pretty well. This person class has an instance method, so-called, called talk. Just one instance method, so a short class definition. And here the talk method prints good afternoon from a person. Now below, the well, the class definition ends with the second end there. right? I open the class definition with class person. Then I define the method, which is the middle three lines. And then I end the class definition with the end keyword um, after the method definition. Now after that, I create a new person. David equals person dot new, and I send David the talk message, which executes the talk method, and I get the expected message. If you want to, you can write a method called initialize, which is a special name for Ruby. If you write a method called initialize, it gets executed when you call class dot new, for instance, person dot new. So here, for example, I've written an initialize method, and I'll explain. There's a couple of new techniques here that, that I'll explain as we go along. The initialize method takes an argument, namely name. So it has one parameter in its method signature. And what it does is it saves the name to an instance variable. The instance variable is that thing with the at sign, at name. And instance variables are basically a stash of object state. So what I'm saying is remember this name. Assign it to the instance variable name. The other name is just a local variable. Um, and then you can reuse the instance variable later in another method. So here we have talk, the, the talk method again redefined or defined differently. And here we say good afternoon from name. Now the technique you're seeing there is string interpolation. In Ruby, if you do that formula with the hash mark and curly braces, anything inside the curly braces will be interpolated into the string. So in this case, it's the string name, whatever name was when you initialized it, which will be put into the message and you'll get good afternoon. In the case of the example at the bottom, we have person.new David, so that's going to be the person's name. And when we say David.talk, we get good afternoon from David. And we'll come back to both of those techniques. We'll talk a little more about instance variables and string interpolation. But that gives you a, a flavor of them. Basically, instance variables are kind of slots for objects to remember things to maintain state. And string interpolation is just a very convenient way to drop calculated code or uh, variables into, uh, into string output. There's also something in Ruby called class methods, which I never like to use the word static around Ruby. They just don't mix. There's just nothing static about Ruby. But class methods in Ruby are, I would say, kind of cousin of what we call static methods in other languages. So here, have a look at the, uh, the syntax here. Class person, again, the, the familiar example. And this time we do def person with a capital P, which is the name of the class, def person dot planet. And that just yields the string earth. Now, in the example at the bottom, we have put as people live on, and then again, string interpolation with the hash mark and the curly braces, person dot planet. And that comes out as people live on earth. So what we've got here is a method at the class level. Person is actually the class object itself, the class itself. It is an object. And person.planet is a method defined directly on that object using that object.method name notation in the class definition. And that gives you the ability to write methods at, at the class level, and again, sort of a cousin of static methods. 
Ruby does have class inheritance. It supports single inheritance only. You can do more sort of mixing and matching of functionality using modules, which we'll also talk about next. Um, but here we have a class called animal, and I'm defining this time not as a class method, but as an instance method. I'm defining a method called planet, which yields Earth. I'm sort of making cosmological assumptions here that there are not animals on other planets, but let's not worry about that. So the planet of an animal is Earth, and that means if you ask an animal, you know, dot planet, it will say Earth, or we'll return the string Earth. And then I have class human less than animal. What that means is that I'm inheriting, I'm creating a new class called human that inherits from the class called animal. And then when I say h equals human dot new, I can say put s h dot planet and I get earth. So the human is basically when I send the message planet, the human object h resolves that message by looking in the super class, that is the class that its class inherited from, and it finds the, uh, the uh, planet method and executes it from there. Now a module is similar to a class, but there's no instances. You don't say module, you know, some module dot new. That doesn't mean anything. You only use dot new with classes. But a module is similar to a class in that a module is also a bundle of methods, and they can be module methods or they can be instance methods. So modules are essentially Ruby's answer to the question of why don't you have multiple inheritance. It's because there are modules, and modules allow you to mix and match functionality at almost any level of granularity. So we talk about mixing a module into a class, and I'll show you an example in a second. And the, the mix in Mean, if you mix in a module, it means that instances of the class can use methods from the module, from the mix-ins. And here's an example. I have a module called vocal. And vocal defines an instance method called talk. And talk, when you call it, just prints the greeting greetings. So pretty much a placeholder little talk method. Then in the middle of the slide, I have class person, and I include vocal. And what that does is it mixes in the vocal module. The include directive means mix this into the class so that instances of this class also encompass the methods defined in that module. Sure enough, when I say David equals person new and I say David.talk, the David object resolves that message by looking in the module, and it finds the talk method, and it executes it and prints out greetings. So modules, this is obviously a very small example, but modules are a great way to sort of mix and match functionality to, uh, to compose classes using, if you, you, know, you don't have multiple inheritance, but you have a way to include different sort of bundles of functionality in the class. Um, per module. All right, we're going to look a little bit at the specifics of Ruby variables. There are four kinds of variables in Ruby. Now I said, but just to clarify, I said variables are untyped, and that means that you don't have specific ones for strings or arrays or hashes. There are different kinds of there are four different kinds of variables, but they're all untyped. In other words, you can assign anything to any variable. So we're looking sort of along a different axis, so to speak, at the different types of variables available to you in Ruby. One type is local, and when you see just a bare letter or bare word like that being assigned to, that's a local variable. Instance variables, and you've seen an example already, start with an at sign. Global variables start with a dollar sign, and class variables start with two at signs. We're going to talk about each of these just briefly in turn. Local variable is scoped, in other words, visible to a class definition, a module definition, or a method definition. If you use a, a local variable outside of any of those, you're using what we call a top-level variable, which is it's different from a global because it doesn't stay in scope when you switch to when you switch into a class or method definition. But as you can see here. 
I've assigned, in the first line, I assigned to A, which is a top-level variable. It's not inside any definition. And then I've got a method definition where I assign to A. I've got a, a class definition where I assign to a local variable A. But at the bottom, when I print out A, that A is still the one I defined at the top. It's not related to the other A's, which exist in different scopes. So there's rules of scoping in Ruby. They're not too hard. They're you know pretty consistent. Method definitions have a local scope. Class definitions and module definitions have a local scope. And then there's the outer scope or the top level scope, um, where you can define locals if you if you so need to. Instance variables, which we saw a little bit already, and actually this is the same slide from before. Um, but here, just throwing the spotlight again on the instance variable, when I initialize the person object, I send in, courtesy of the, the method parameter name, I send in a string for the name. And I stash that string in the instance variable at name, at sign name, so that later I can retrieve it in the talk method and say good afternoon from and print the name. So instance variables, as I said, are kind of slots for maintaining state per object. Global variables, well, you know, I think many of us are global variable skeptics. We don't really use them to speak of, but Ruby does have some handy built-in ones. Um, this is just a sampling, but the, the uh, they all, again, they all begin with dollar signs, but these, some of these funny looking ones include the library load path for when you're loading um, standard library extensions or third party extensions, input record separator in case you want to parse a file using something other than new lines as the input record separator, you can actually assign to that. ID of current process, result of most recent system command call, and then the dollar one, two, three, and so forth are the parenthetical captures from the most recent regular expression match operation. There's other ways to get those captures. These are sometimes referred to sort of pejoratively as the Perl-like regular expression variables, which they are, um, and there's other ways to do it in Ruby, but, uh, but you do have those variables if you want them. Class variables are they're actually scoped per class hierarchy. I'm not going to get too deeply into that, but it means if you inherit between classes, you actually share the class variables. They're not really per class. They're per class hierarchy. But here's a simple example which demonstrates the fact that if you assign to a, a, a class variable, in this case planet, yet another way to record planet, uh, the class variable at at planet equals Earth. And then inside an instance method, that class variable is still in scope. So I can still use it if I want to either at the class level or inside an instance method. Um, in this case, the instance method planet, which simply wraps the class variable planet. So those are the four types of variables in Ruby. We also have constants. And you've seen them already because when I say class person, person is actually a constant. It begins with a capital letter, which is the, the telltale sign of a constant in Ruby. Um, and they're used for names of classes and modules and also defined inside classes and modules. So here you see class person and I have planet in capital letters equals Earth. And then to resolve that constant, I say put as person colon, colon, planet. And the colon, colon is the constant lookup operator or constant resolution operator. So what you're saying there is, find me the constant planet that's defined inside the class or module person. And sure enough, it, it finds it and it's defined as Earth. They are, just to look at the, the fourth bullet point here, Ruby constants are not really constant. You can actually reassign to them. Uh, but you do get a warning. So again, very dynamic language. There's really, you know, you can uh, you can sort of eat the dishes, so to speak. You know, you have constants, but they're not really constant. You can actually bend them and flex them and so forth. But you do get a warning. It's not a best practice. If you find yourself redefining constants, maybe they should be instance variables or class variables or something. Okay, a couple of special objects in Ruby. We have true and false, which are objects. 
nil, which is kind of the special non-object, is actually an object. And it's used, you know, typically in method invocations or re return values from methods that w want to indicate that not necessarily something went wrong, but just that, that the, uh, the calculation didn't result in anything or uh, there's not, sort of nothing to report. So there is this nil object for that purpose. In addition to the Boolean objects true and false, every object in Ruby has a Boolean value. And the Boolean value of false and nil is false. In other words, the object false and the object nil both have false as their Boolean value. Everything else in Ruby is true. That includes the object true, which is, of course, true. And it includes everything else except nil and false. So here's an example which sort of dramatizes the fact that 0 is true in Ruby, unlike some languages. If 0, put S0 is true in Ruby, and sure enough, we get the message because 0 is true. So it, Thinking of Boolean value as kind of how, how would it behave in an if statement, everything passes an if statement except nil and false. And of course, certain expressions evaluate to false. Like if you say if 3 is less than 2 or something, you know, that will evaluate to false um, and so forth. And then that will, in the Boolean sense, be false and won't pass the if test. So it, it all sort of falls into place that way. But 0 is true, empty strings are true, empty arrays are true, and so forth. Okay, we're going to turn our attention to some built-in classes in Ruby, starting with strings. And you've seen a couple of string constructs, constructs already. But we'll just go a little bit into more detail. You can have single or double quoted strings. Double quoted strings allow you to put things in like slash n for a new line or slash t for a tab, um, whereas single quoted strings will sort of li literalize those. There's all sorts of things you can do with strings, and you'll see a couple of examples on the next slide, but you can upcase them, reverse them, and so forth. Um, there's a pretty complete toolkit. Double quoted strings allow this interpolation of code using the, the hash mark and curly braces that you've seen already. And again, it only works with double quoted strings. So here, to put us 2 plus 2 is, and then I interpolate 2 plus 2, and I get, of course, 2 plus 2 is 4. So you can interpolate not only variable names, but arbitrary code. Um, you know, you want to keep it reasonably kind of concise and clear and so forth. And usually it's a variable name or a method call or something. But, but anything that goes in there will evaluate to its own string representation. So 2 plus 2 is actually an integer, not a string. But the string representation of 4 is the string 4. And that's what ends up getting dropped into the string in that position. OK, just a few things you can put strings through their paces. Uh, up case a string, down case a string, swap case a string. You don't see that in the wild very often, but it's there. Um, there's a delete method there in the middle of the slide. If I say delete a-m, it deletes everything between a and m. I get an um, You can also do chars, code points, and lines. So there's different ways to sort of process a string as an array of, of characters, of bytes, and so forth. Um, string.next, you can actually increment a string. Notice that this one ends with an H instead of a G, because that's the next one up. I've incremented my string. String start with SAM is true, and string clear just empties the string um, and leaves you with an empty string. OK, a little bit about arrays. There's a literal array constructor, the square brackets. You put your list of items inside there. I've used pretty simple ones here. Any item, any object can go inside an array, including other arrays. So you can nest arrays arbitrarily deep, if you so desire. Um, Array indexing is also done with square brackets. So here, a sub 0 is 1. Negative indexing goes from the right. So a sub negative 1 is 5. Here you can get two elements starting in index 1 using a sub 1, comma 2. That's just one way to sort of slice and dice arrays. 
a little bit about arrays, uh, array manipulation. Array first and last give you first and last elements. Reverse, I didn't print this out for some reason, but it's what you'd expect, the same elements but backwards. You can pop from the end of an array. You can push back to the end of an array. There's also shift and unshift for the front of the array. You can look up the index of an item. So the index of, of the string 3 is 2. You can count how many of an item there are in the array. In this case, there's one of the string 2. And you can look at the values at particular indices and get back a subarray of those values. And there's, there's plenty more, too. Um, but that gives you a little bit of the basics. I want to talk, actually still sticking to arrays, I want to talk about array iteration and um, how, you can, how you can actually travel or traverse arrays um, and do things with the contents. An iterator, and we're going to talk a little bit about iterators. An iterator is a method that takes a code block, which is basically an anonymous function, and control is yielded to the code block from the method. Now this is probably best illustrated by example. Once you see it, it's, it, I think, sort of falls into place. Here we have the same array, the five words. In the second line, I say a dot each. And then there's this thing in curly braces. This is a code block. The thing between pipes is a block parameter. And what each does is that for each element in the array, it binds the element to the block parameter and then executes the block. So here, it's going to bind the variable item to each of those strings in turn and then print out the item upcase. And that's, in fact, what it does, as you see. So each is an iterator and goes through the entire array. There's other array iterators, most of which are, in one way or another, based on each, um, kind of under the hood. But here, for example, I have array select item where item size is greater than 3. So my code block is essentially saying, find me everything whose size or length is greater than 3, and I find three, a subset of 3 items. There's also a reject, which is the opposite of select. There's a whole handful of Boolean iterators, again, the same array. If I say a dot any, and I say item, item size is greater than 5, that's false because none of them is is greater than the longest one is five is not greater than five. A dot all size less than six is true. A dot one item equals four that's true. A dot none item equals one that's false because it is in the array. Um, and these are actually very handy for uh, sort of logic, um, depending on your your program, of course. But they're they're good to know about. If you want to map an array across a function, you can use the map method, which is different from each, because each just runs the, the block for its side effects. Map actually returns a second array of the same length as the first, but with the result of calling the code block in the array instead of the original element. So here I'm mapping it across item.upcase. So I'm upcasing each of the, uh, each of the items. Um, you can also, instead of curly braces, you can use the do end delimiters, which are almost exactly equivalent. There's some slightly obscure stuff about precedence um, being higher for curly braces, but you generally don't have to worry about that. Um, so there's a, an alternative style, if you like that better. All right, I want to talk a little bit about iterators, because they're a really cool thing in Ruby. Um, an iterator, you can write, we said each is an iterator, select is an iterator, all, any and all are iterators. You can write an iterator if you use the yield keyword. You're basically going to yield control back to a code block or an anonymous function. The code block is part of the method call. So, and you've seen that with the each examples and so on. And you do this with the yield keyword. So here's an example. Up at the top, we have a method called fib calculator. And it takes one argument which defaults to 10. That's the n equals 10. And it sets a and b to 1 and 1. And then n dot times, which is a nice method in Ruby to execute something n times, I yield a. Now, when I yield a, what happens is, and the arrow, I think, is, is pointing a little bit 
too far to the right, at least on my screen, but it should point right to that fib in bold letters. Notice what I have when I call the fib calculator. I say fib calculator 5 do fib. I give it a block parameter, and I say next fib is, and then that particular fib. So I get next fib is 1, 1, 2, 3, 5. So I'm actually writing here my own iterator and yielding yielding values to it and printing them out. So it's a powerful technique that you can use to maintain a this sort of dialogue between the method and your anonymous function or your code block. Um, and you can you know, use the built-in ones, but you can also write them yourself. All right, just a little bit about hashes, which are kind of dictionary data structure. Um, they're actually ordered. They used to be unordered. They're now ordered by key insert, order of key insertion. They're created with curly braces and refer or dereferenced with the square brace operator. So here we have a hash states, which hashes state abbreviations to full state names. And you can see the ha sort of hash rocket separator showing the uh, the keys on the left and the values on the right. If I want states the uh, look up the abbreviation NY, I get New York. I can say, do you have key PA, which is false. There's no PA key. I can select a subhash by asking for all the ones where the state size is greater than 8, and I get a result of two key value pairs from the original hash in my new hash. If I update the state, I, or sorry, the, the hash states, I'm basically adding PA Pennsylvania key value pair to that hash. So you can manipulate hashes in various ways. All right, turning to another feature of Ruby, which I think is, is um, particularly interesting. A lot of infix operators at, in Ruby are actually methods. So look at the middle of the slide where it says 1 plus 1. What is that in Ruby? It's actually 1 dot plus, I'm calling a method called plus sign with an argument of 1. But Ruby lets you have the syntactic sugar of using it as an infix operator, even though it's really parsed as a method call, or it's, it's interpreted, I should say, as a method call. 10 times 3 is really 10 dot star with, a, with, a, um, with an argument of 3. And even the square brackets where you index and set array values are actually methods. So if you define, you can actually do def plus. You can define a plus sign method in your own classes, and you'll get this syntactic sugar for free. So it's just a way of making it look a little nicer than it would if they were actually method calls. OK. Just a little bit about regular expressions. They're, they are first class objects in Ruby. Um, there's a literal constructor, which is the slashes. Um, and you can use a, there's a method called match, or you can use the equal tilde operator. And match returns a, an instance of the match data class. And the equal tilde operator returns the um, offset of the match, or nil if there is no match. And just a couple of examples here. We have string New Jersey's estate, regular expression. I'm not going to go deep into regular expression syntax, but basically new and then um, some non-string characters. And here I get a match data object that lets me examine the, the original string. The capture, the parenthetical captures, the pre-match, the post-match, and so on. So you can really slice and dice the results of regular expression um, operation very easily. And you can use regular expressions to scan strings. So there's a string scan method, which scans strings based on regular expressions. And um, again, another way to sort of parse or slice and dice strings. Um, and there is also scanf, as I mentioned. But we'll, if, if time allows, we'll talk about that very briefly at the end. Um, OK. I wanted to say just a little bit about function objects, also known as procs. 
I, here I have func equals proc.new, and notice I give it a code block, x, and or you know, the parameter x, and, and the block evaluates to x times 10. I can then call this function using the call method, and I get 30. So I can actually write my own sort of anonymous functions. Um, well, it's not anonymous anymore because it's in a variable, but you, you get the point. You can write your own functions. Uh, and you can call them and uh, pass them around as objects. They are actually objects. So here, there's actually a special uh, notation where you use a, a, an ampersand and the name of a proc, and you can use that instead of a code block. So here I have map func equals proc new string dot upcase dot reverse, sort of whimsical example an array consisting of New York, New Jersey, map. And instead of a code block, you don't see any curly braces here or do end. I just send it the proc, but with the ampersand in front of it, and it knows to use that as a code block. And symbols, we haven't talked about symbols, but symbols are a special um, sort of uh, class in Ruby. But a symbol will work. Here I have map ampersand colon upcase, and that's using the symbol upcase. Um, we'll save symbols for another time, but uh, but that's a, a shortcut you can use to uh, to send a proc object. Okay. Just a word about keyboard I/O. We talked about print and put s. Get s is the sort of bread and butter way to get a string from the keyboard. Um, a little bit about file reading. Um, you can open a file and you get a file handle yielded to the block file.open do fh. You can get s from a file. You can put s to a file. You can read the whole contents of a file. You can, re you can read the lines into an array of lines or read the whole thing into a, uh, into a, a a single string with file.read. So there's a lot of, um, it's really a full toolkit, which this is just scratching the surface of. But, uh, but there's everything you could, you could want or need for file reading and writing. OK, I wanted just to quickly talk a little bit about a few standard library Features and we'll we'll uh, we'll end with this and I'm just going to scan a few of them very quickly. The standard library is pretty rich in Ruby. Here's one called OpenURI. If you require OpenURI and then you use Open and a and a URI, you actually get the content of it. It's as easy as opening a file, but you get, in this case, the contents of the Google home page. So that's kind of nice. Um, there's one called temp file, which creates a unique file name. If you don't want to have to munge your own temporary file names, you have a way to do it in Ruby that uh, that um, that does it for you and finds your temp directory. You can override the directory if you need to. Scanf, dear to my heart, as I am the chief author, as I mentioned, it's very similar to the Scanf system call. Here you require scanf, and I do string dot scanf percent s percent d, and notice that I get back the string David and the integer 55. It actually knows to convert from from the string to the integer because of the percent d. Um, so that's a, a handy one, and I think good to know about. File utils gives you some Unix file like instructions. For instance, file utils dot Make dear underscore p is like make dear dash p. Rm underscore rf is like rm rf, and so forth. So that if you're at home with that set of um, practices, that will that will feel natural to you. Pri a prime number library again, just to give you the flavor of the standard library. It tells you if something is prime. It gives you the first five or the first n prime numbers with prime dot first, and you can. Take while means show me the prime numbers as long as they're under 100. So that gives you up to 97, um, and that's um, you know again just something you might not, might not use every day, but just to show you some of the richness of what's in the standard library. 
And just a few um, a few URLs, the Ruby homepage, Ruby Central, which puts on conferences and events. RubyDoc.org is very useful. It shows you the current and past documentation for Ruby. And finally, if you if you like what you've seen and you want more, there's always my book, The Well-Grounded Rubyist, coming out in the second edition this hopefully this spring, I think in June. It's available now for pre-order. Um, so have a look if you're interested. And that concludes our little tour. I'm happy to um, take questions, which I believe we're going to do next. So back to you, Eric. Yeah, thank you, um, David. Um, that was uh, super interesting. Um, uh, there are uh, quite a lot of questions, and um, they come in um, kind of you know, chunks. So a couple of them all are about you know um, what's uh, Ruby's uh, raison d'être, um, how does it differ from Python or uh, JavaScript? Uh, could you uh, you know dive into that a little bit? Sure. Um, you know it's interesting because when people talk about Python, which is the language I have very little experience with, I'll, I'll say up front, but I mean I have a sort of reading knowledge of it, but I've never really used it. But I remember going to a talk, an introductory talk about Python, um, which really sounded it was kind of it was kind of startling because it sounded exactly like an introductory talk about Ruby, not point for point technically, but when the, the person introduced the language, they said, you know, it's very clean, it's very clear, it's very close to sort of programmer intention, it's elegant, it's this, it's that. All of the discussion, the sort of meta discussion about the language was very, very similar to Ruby. And I sort of take that as my cue. As I said, I don't really know Python, but um, I... I I am one of these people that doesn't really like significant white space, so I was a little put off by that. And I, you know, that's the kind of risk that you run if you write a language with significant white space. Um, Ruby actually has started warning you about unmatching ends for class and method definitions. So there's, but you can still do it. You just now you get warned. Um, but my understanding is that Python and Ruby share. You know, have in common maybe more than they differ in some way, in some respect. I mean, that may be subject to uh, to further scrutiny, but uh, but I think they're uh, you know they're they're very much kind of cut from the same cloth. JavaScript, I think, is a little different. It doesn't have the same class-based model object model that Ruby has, so I think it, its object model is a little bit more different if that makes sense. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think there's certain things that all object-oriented languages have in common, probably. And I think, you know, there, there's certain attempts to make JavaScript, well, I don't know if this is fair, or maybe I'm editorializing. I, I think, you know, to make JavaScript a little more Ruby-like, um, there was prototype, there's coffee script, which I'm not a big expert at, but which I think is partly inspired by some things from Ruby, as I understand it. Um, but I, I kind of like my JavaScript pure. I don't know. I, I like JavaScript. I uh, I like um, when it you know there's certain times when I use it at work or use it for a client, and I, I certainly like it a lot. All right. Well, thanks so much. Um, and then there are um, a few questions about yield. Um, and uh, you know, can you go into a little bit more detail, or uh, uh, go over the example again? Um, and I am also kind of interested, um, personally, how that is implemented. If you uh, know uh, how that, uh, if that's I'm how sorry, the, which, that. Which so one the, was that? Okay, so this is about yield. So um, the one question oh, right. is. Okay. And you know also about the details and the implementation details. Right, right. Okay, it might take me just a second to find it. Of course. Um, but I will do so. Um, 
Yeah, just give me one second here. The it's the one with the big arrow, Fibonacci. Um, well, I'll let me. Yeah, okay, here it is. Okay, good. Um, let me re re constitute that slide. Okay, um, there it is. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. L yeah. Let me talk a little bit more about about yielding. The idea is that when you make the method call, if you focus for the moment on the bottom of the slide where it says fib calculator five do fib, and then it uses that fib variable in the next line. Next fib is, and then it interpolates fib. What's happening here is I'm providing a code block to my method call. And when you provide a code block, what you're it, you're, you're basically inviting the method to yield control to the block. And again, you can think of the block as essentially an anonymous function. So the block is ready to be executed, and the, the method, and now if you look up to the top of the slide, the, the method fib calculator yields a value to the code block, and that value will be bound to the block variable. And you can have, by the way, more than one block or block parameter. You can have more than one. In this case, there's just one. So what happens is in fib calculator, I'm do, you know, doing the basic Fibonacci calculation, A, B equals B, A plus B. That's using, I should have mentioned this, so using parallel assignments. So it's really A equals B and B equals A plus B and so on. Um, but each time through, I'm yielding the next Fibonacci number to the code block, and then the code block takes that number and, and prints it out. So it's a way of kind of sharing the execution flow between the method itself and the method call. Um, and some of those examples involving each, for instance, array.each, um, Let's see if I can. Or okay, here's for example. Oh, uh, sorry. Array dot map. Right here, I have. Well, I'm using the code block. The code block with curly braces rather than do end. But as I said, they're close to being equivalent. So I have an array, and I say array dot map, and I provide this code block, this function, where I say. It's essentially, you know, for each item, provide me with item dot upcase, um, and it returns this array of the original array mapped across this function. So, in this particular case, in Ruby's definition of map, somewhere off, it's actually written in C, but you know, essentially, there's a yield instruction that says yield to the code block. Um, you know, wrapped in the C language of the Ruby interpreter. But essentially, map is yielding the same way the Fibonacci calculator yielded. We don't have map here on the screen, but somewhere up in Ruby land, you know, map is yielding items one at a time to the to the code block and returning the uh, the resulting array of executing the code block for each item. So that's that's a little bit a little bit deeper into yield and uh, hopefully makes sense. All right, thanks so much. Um, and so one question that's related to this is, um, you know, what is the kind of, you know, scope of the variables um, inside a function that does yield? That's one part. And then I think related to that as well, it's like, how do you debug uh, Ruby programs? And um, for example, does the debugger work with yields where it's kind of, you know, if you put a breakpoint in a function that has a yield, does that work properly? Um, yes, as far as just starting with that one, as far as I know, it it does. Um, I've been using Rails a lot and using the um, the Pry um, debugger more than the uh, sort of Ruby debugger. But yeah, it should it should follow the you know follow the trail pretty pretty closely. Um, now I'm sorry, I've gone and forgotten the first part of the question. Uh, yeah, what is the scope of uh, variables? Oh, right, inside? thank you. Right, thank you. Okay, yes, code blocks are closures. So if a variable exists already, you can use it inside the code block, and it will it will persist in the code block even if the the method 
goes out of scope. Um, so if you create a proc function, uh, I'm sorry, if you create a, a proc object, um, you can use vari variables in the environment of the, at the time of the proc's creation, and they'll stay alive inside the proc. There's a bunch of rules. I won't go into all of it. There are a bunch of rules about um, if you know if you use a, a variable that doesn't exist, then it expires at the end of the code block. If you want to protect variable names, you can actually put a semicolon and a list of variable names or parameters inside the, the, the pipes, and those will be treated as locals even if they exist outside. So you can kind of protect variables from being clobbered inside your code blocks. So there's, there's a whole sort of toolkit of, of techniques, but basically they're closures. That's, I think, the key, the key point. Okay, um, and since we're kind of you know, running towards the end of the um, webinar, um, a few last questions, and one, um, you know, I think important one is when people got inspired by this presentation and want to set up a Ruby development um, environment, uh, what should they do and how do they do that? Where can they find it? I would say the advice I always give is go to the Ruby homepage, which is here, ruby-lang.org. You'll do much better than me trying to you know, come up with what I did last time I installed it. I will say that there's a couple of Ruby version managers that are really cool because as Ruby versions change, you can keep old versions around or you know, use different versions um, for different purposes or, or you know, different uh, different libraries and so on. But I would use that as a starting point with the ruby-lang.org and there'll be information there about downloading and installing Ruby for different platforms. All right. Um, and another question is, um, is uh, Ruby suitable for writing UIs um, on the, you know, that's going to be on one side, and um, to access like you know USB ports and serial ports and kind of you know system level things um, on the other side. I'm sorry. What, what was the first part of the question? Suitable for um, it, uh, UIs for GUIs. And then, kind of, you know, on the other side of the spectrum, you know, can you access, you know, like um, serial ports and uh, low-level things like that? Right, right. Um, I think for the low-level stuff, I think it's a little bit of a specialization that I haven't really gotten into. I think the answer may be that there are some third-party libraries that do. Stuff like that. I know there's there's been embedded rubies um, in devices and so on. Um, so I I certainly think it's possible for the GUI side of it. Um, there is a TK library. There's a couple of others. Again, it's not an area that I've looked at in great depth, at least not recently. But there definitely are some libraries out there. Was it? Fox, am I remembering that correctly? I, I think I think there's a library called Fox, um, but there there is a whole TK toolkit for Ruby, so it's certainly used for that. Uh, some I I don't know that that's considered sort of the, the Ruby sweet spot, but it's it's certainly some of that is definitely out there. All right, um, and then um, the last question is. Um, what is the best uh, beginner's book for uh, Ruby uh, new newbies? Right. Well, that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> that's why I did it. <laughs> right. There's there's actually a couple of it. I'll I'll give a a quick three part answer. One, if it's someone who's really new to programming, there is a book called Learning to Program with Ruby or a title like that by Chris Pine which is, as the title suggests, it's really learning to program but using Ruby. For Ruby itself, I mean, you know, I, I'm partial to my book because I wrote it, so it represents what I think people should do. It's basically aimed at people who have done some programming, maybe even some Ruby, but want to kind of go through it systematically. And then there is the Programming Ruby book from the uh, 
pragmatic programmers, which I think is still a you know a classic and a standard. Um, and I'd certainly you know not hesitate to recommend that either. All right. Well, I um, I'm afraid to have run out of time. Um, thank you so much, David, for your great presentation and you know the nice answers you gave to all the questions. Um, and all the uh, viewers and listeners, thank you so much for taking your time to attend and participate today. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And uh, oh, now I'm okay. There we go. This. Uh, yeah, um, and don't forget to um, go um, to the um, Learning Center to um, fill in the survey. Um, the webinar has been recorded and will be available online. There were a couple of questions, you know, um, here about, you know, we would love to share this with our team. Um, yes, you can do that. Um, and the slides, I assume, will also be there. Um, so thank you so much. Goodbye for now. Take care, and thanks for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you uh, another time. And have a lot of fun um, hacking Ruby. Thank you. <laughs>